Can you turn the mic on? Can you turn the mic on? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Oh. I was first. Sure. You want the lights off? Pardon? You want the lights off? No. no. It'll be bright enough. Okay. It just takes a long, long time. Do you need a microphone? I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. Because these things are there to generate money, they're not there to generate uh, goodwill. 
just money. The other is that recently there's been a lot of talk about these polyfluoroalkyl substances. And by the way, I'm a chemist, so I know a little bit about these. This is essentially what people refer to as Teflon, and some of the chemicals are used to make Teflon. Um, they did some work on this. You can see that last line. There's only been three reports of field measurements about these. None of those talk about the presence of these chemicals. Um, but if you have Teflon pans at home and heat them over medium heat, you're going to generate energy. So be careful and don't do that. But this is the conclusion. I just pulled this over the last page of the report. But based on the available scientific information, I'm not going to read all this. But essentially, under normal conditions, these solar panels are sealed and they're not going to leak, and they're not going to contaminate the field that they're mounted on. Um, I talked about the PAFs, PFAS as well, and based on some hydro hydrogeological information, it's unlikely that during normal operation that the uh, solar panels themselves are going to contaminate the surface water or the water that gets down into the drainage tunnels which are going to come out of the problems. So, so basically, the last thing, based on available information, it's highly unlikely the solar farm will negatively affect the quality of the groundwater and normal operating conditions. Now this is something that those commissioners paid for and they've moved into <coughs> having those solar parks installed. The other that came up was that don't recycle solar panels. Well, if you go to the US BPA site, you will go to their solar site and they will send you to this site, which is the uh, National Association of Solar uh, Industry, I'll call it. And notice that they do recycle things. There are 12 different firms listed on this site to recycle. I just picked one for solar, which is right in the middle. And this is what they do. They basically, semiconductors are made. They use them. They need to be replaced for whatever reason. They go back and recycle. So the glass goes into making other glass containers. The encapsulants, <coughs> the plastics that's used to make them waterproof and things like that, those go into making rubber products. The semiconductor cell is, is recycled and they make more silicon wafers to put back into the machines and put them back in the field. Notice on the right hand side, uh, automotive industry, about 75% of your cars recycle. Uh, information technology, my cell phone, computer, screens, about 45% gets recycled. But for solar, their modules are 90% recycled. So these panels are recycled when they're damaged. They're replaced when they're damaged because these people want to continue to make money. Now, if there's one thing that you can't get around, solar panels by themselves in a field are just flat out ugly. Uh, I don't know if any of you have done it, but I took a trip up to Randolph County, and there is a solar installation up there that's been in about a year and a half. And I will tell you that I sat down with GeneX and said that if your place is going to look like this, if they put it in, then I'm not going to support it because it's just flat out ugly. <coughs> However, they said we would work with Franklin County to try to fix that. But let's take a look at some of these things. Because there's two things to learn here. Number one is that I don't think anybody wants to sit and look at these things. But notice how they're put in the ground. I heard a lot of work, a lot of questions about all the concrete that was going to be poured, and all the concrete that was going to cover the ground. They use very little concrete. If you notice, this is not going to work today. Oh well, no problem. Anyway, that panel is sitting on a post. Almost all the panels sit on a post. It's sometimes it's high beam, sometimes it's some other metal, but they drive them into the ground and drive them deep enough that they can support these panels and take about 150 mile an hour wind without any issues whatsoever. Taking them out of the ground is just as easy as putting them in. You drive them in with a hydraulic ram, you pull them out with something that can actually grab it and pull it out. So there's no lasting concrete footings or anything like that over there. Except there are inverters, which would be all about the size of where John and Tom are sitting here. And that would have to have a concrete pad. Those are sitting inside, so that will have a concrete pad. But that, again, can be taken out because it's just a normal pad on the ground. It's not very deep into the ground or anything like that. So as far as being able to decommission these things, they're pretty easily done. Now, this is, a, this is that river start. That's the one that's in Randolph County. Feel free to go up and take a look at it. You'll also find that the crops are not dying that are being planted next to these things. There's corn and beans all over the place up there. And uh, there's no effect from the solar part in front of it. I should say, diminishing their, their, their crops. This is actually a picture of a facility being put in by GMX over in Ohio. It's about a two and a half hour drive from here. 
And I'm sitting in the road, and I'm taking this picture with my cell phone from my van. And they have about a two or three hundred foot set back there. And you can see that without any screening at all, it's hard to make out those solar panels. That's a bean field in front, by the way. So any of the setbacks uh, in all the solar farms I've seen or looked up, most of them are being used for planting crops. So it's not like the land just sits there and does nothing. Uh, uh, this is an example. This came from some research paper. I don't know that we can actually want to go to the trouble of planting things under the panels, but they're compatible with growing food. Uh, they're not going to kill anything. Even cows don't die. But this is a big one, a really big one. Do solar parks reduce property values? So I went out looking for real studies and real information. What I found was this from the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. And uh, there's a lot of words in here, but essentially what it comes down to is that they found either a neutral impact or ironically a positive impact. Some of these, or another study I found, they looked at solar installations in six different states, uh, Connecticut being one of them. Connecticut's a very densely packed state. There's a lot of people who live there in that small area. Their property values actually went up by 5%. In North Carolina, where this GNAS company is from, some property values went down by 5%. All of these were measured within a half a mile of the solar farm. Not a thousand feet, not two miles, but a half a mile. Uh, it goes on, there's some other people quoted in this. Uh, basically, uh, there's that minus five to plus five difference up there. This person considered to be statistically in insignificant. He's looking at matched pairs, he said if you actually go through and look at the average, it's about 1%. And then down below, the uh, person said, finding any consistent negative impact from solar farms, as long as there are at least 100 feet between the solar farm and the property, and enough landscaping to hide the panels. And that last one is really, really important as far as I'm concerned, is that if we want this stuff to disappear, we need the right kind of landscaping around it. And that is possible to do that. It's going to require GeneX or whatever solar company would want to come here in the future. Uh, we need to have that in our zoning so that we make sure that we make that disappear. So that when you look out, it looks like a tree lot, which we already have up in about town, so just about every place else. Now, the last thing, and we talked a little bit about this at the council meeting, but I wanted to bring this back because uh, Reedy took another look at this, and if there is no abatement given on the personal property with the land assessed value coming up, the personal property value, at the end of 25 years, if we create a TIF, and a TIF is uh, basically a place where something new comes in, property value goes up, Somebody pays that extra property, but instead of going to the general fund, it goes into a fund to be used all over the county uh, to work on projects that we actually need to look at, and we still don't have enough funding to do that now. So about $30 million over 25 years. And this, they did this quickie thing where they said, we might be able to float a $14 million bond, for instance. And they looked at some of the things that we might want to take a look at, expanding the fresh water supply. There's a lot of problems with that in the county, as you know and wastewater treatment facilities have a problem with that. Then they actually, these asterisks here are budget items that are in the budget now. Brian, you probably know about this. Uh, these are things that they're in the budget, but they're not being paid for because we don't have the funds for them. What they're saying is with a, with a bond, we might be able to take these dollars out of the budget and return this dollars to more of the operational funds that we have in the county. Um, I'm not sure that one-time shot is the best thing to do with a, with a bond because you should be able to use it over time to pay for more things off. Uh, but as it turns out this morning, I got a phone, uh, an email message from somebody in the western part of the county. And this is the email message. I, I thought it would be important to tell you that it might be a good idea to have money to, to treat, I shouldn't say treat, but address some of these problems because there are people out there, in fact, I think uh, Sheriff Case, Deputy Melbauer, I think lives someplace where he has to haul the water uh, for a system. So, but this is a problem, and if we have the money to do it, then we can help the water companies extend these water lines. Uh, as an example, I talked to uh, Franklin County Water Association, and I'd asked if they had ever thought about needing to run water lines, and they said, well, if any kind of housing was built over the Grand Township, they would need to run a bigger water line over there. Guessing years ago it would be a million, maybe two million dollars to do it now. But we can actually go out and to try to get USB grants or loans, but if we had the extra money from this kind of installation, uh, then we would be able to match money and things like that a lot more easily. 
Now, the other thing that I want to touch on is just, no matter whether we have a moratorium or not, this is still under the control of the county. They have to make an application for the project APC. They have to follow our zoning. I beat that into them day in and day out. You have to follow our zoning. You do not come in and ask for variance. Because we put this together in 2019. And by the way, GNX called weekly, wanting to know if they could come to the APC meetings and help the APC write a good ordinance. I told them no, 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 and they never showed up. And the reason being is that it had to be a Franklin County ordinance, and it is. The people on APC, Dave Mannix, and those other people, you put this together, not GNX. So you have your zone. Next, the applicant has to pay for a consultant to help Franklin County actually go through and evaluate the details of the product, both the science technical problems and also how it fits in with the range and things like that. Technical review then assures the applicant has all the necessary information and details in order. If you're in good schedule with the APC. After that, the APC forwards a recommendation to commissioners. The commissioners can approve or deny the project. So from day one, if somebody wants to put one of these in, whether it's GeneX or somebody else that comes down the road, and I'll pretty much guarantee you there will be somebody else because that power line and having the capacity to handle the kind of power they want to put out, you still have control of this whether there's more toward it or not. It, uh, it's not in their hands at all. It's only in Franklin County's hands. Last thing, this is kind of a, sorry I'm so small, but this is the checklist based on our zoning that we already have. And notice in there that- Recording in progress. That's good. Notice that it's under the decommissioning plan, which is about a third of the way down. They have to have a decommissioning plan. It has to be funded either through cash, a bond, or some kind of insurance. And all of this has to be checked off by Caitlin before they can actually move this on to the APC. If this isn't done, if every one last piece of this is not done, it doesn't move forward. So again, we wrote good controls in it. Whoever worked on that back in 2018 did a good job. Uh, and I, again, I had no input in it on purpose. I don't think economic development should actually tell the APC what to do. But I do agree with, I do say this, whatever tool they come up with is a tool I can use to help attract business here. That's, that's my job, which I'm well paid for. Zero dollars last time I checked. So anyway, this is the last thing that has to be done before anything's done, but that essentially is what I'm saying is, these are the things that are happening. I do think that in a perfect world, we wouldn't need a moratorium, but given the information I put up here, which contradicts what many people think is true, we do need a moratorium of some kind to be able to lay this out, look this stuff up, get pertinent and reliable information about what, what is true and what isn't true. And in fact, uh, Connie asked at our last meeting, I think maybe jokingly Connie, that you know, would GNX pay uh, to help do some of these work, do a conference plan and things like that. If they were confident that they were going to be putting a solar plant in, we could ask. I don't know if they'd say yes or no, but we could ask. So, But what it comes down to is this. I think we need some kind of moratorium. I would prefer something less than a year, but I'm going to leave the commissioners. It's going to be their decision, not mine. Uh, that's my recommendation. But I do think that it's something that requires a lot of thought, and we have to go through and make sure that the, uh, the plan that we have is good. But if you take a look at the plan uh, and you read through it, you'll find a lot of things that have been asked or questions have been raised uh, or claims have been made are actually addressed in that zoning plan. And it is, uh, like I said, I have to pat it, you see on the back, they did a good job back then. And I will tell you, it is among the most restrictive plans in the entire state. And that's, uh, that's coming from the people in the business. So, anyway, any questions at this point? Could you address drainage? It's addressed, in, it's addressed in the zone, and I didn't want to get into all the details, Bob, but it's, they have to have a drainage plan. In fact, uh, let me see if I can make this up. I think that is... Drainage and erosion. You found it, right? Yeah. So that's addressed there as well. So. Yeah. Is that good? We, without a drainage plan, though, that... Well, now that comes down to... <laughs> What, that comes down to what the APC has or what the drainage board has approved. So, yeah. But there has to be some compliance. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I got a question. <coughs> Why if it uh, starts taking stuff into the bricks, they got a way to shut it off? I'm sorry, say that again. If the panel break and you said there ain't nothing in them, but Dan X told us there was before. I don't know. I don't know what they told you is in them, but I can tell you what's in them. I was here, so I know. Well, I can tell you what is in them. And basically, they're silicon wafers. They're either what they call monocrystalline or polycrystalline. I don't care what. If it leaks into the trick, do we have a way to shut it off? Because we got property on both sides. Of There's nothing that will leak into the creek. I hear you. Yeah. I've heard that shit before. Uh, hey, I used to work in the industry <laughs> making silicon wafers, and those things are so inert it's ridiculous. But you're working with them, sir. No, I'm actually acting as a county representative, talking to them, making sure that they fit what we want before they come. Are they going to do to the commissioner? Are they going to put something in to stop it so they can't run it from my house? That's all I'm asking. You say there's nothing in it, but if there is, who's going to stop it? Well, if you, I'll tell you what, you get, if you want to get a copy of that report I started out with, they hang talk on about, on hang on a second, hang on a second. That report goes into not just the toxicity of the panels, and that there isn't any. It also goes into drainage and depending on how the ground is prepared. So it goes into the drainage plan that Bob is talking about. All this is covered in the APC. But the actual movement of anything that might, maybe, possibly leak out of a panel will probably be stopped way before it ever gets to the drainage tiles that are buried down in the ground. Well, they're going to collapse the ground. I'm sorry? You told us that the last time that they wouldn't drive, that you got something to tell them where it is, and I talked about like tiles, and you can't find them. Well, I know that that's a problem, and that's why in the agreement with us, they have to fix anything that they hit. And again, they, with the requirement in our zoning code, I think Rob might have been involved in putting this in, was that they have to go through the system with ground penetrating radar. Anybody you work with trying to find a tile that used up? No, he used a rod. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is expensive. And actually, they do use essentially radar to look deep into the ground and find out what's under there. And they have to map every square foot of what they're going to do before they start driving these piles in. So that's. So they're going to skip panels in where there is no that would be nice. They could. I don't know. I'm not going to talk about what they're going to do because I don't know. Uh, I think that actually depending on what they're putting in. For instance, one picture you saw, there was a post here, a post here, and a number of panels between those two posts on some kind of ledge. They might do something like that. They might drive a post, put a panel, or a post. Put a I don't know. That's up to their engineering and things like that. But they're obligated not to wreck the drainage, whether it's a drain that is only draining the property they're working on, or there's somebody else's tile that comes in from another piece of property draining across that property to a stream. So they're obligated to make sure they don't mess that up. What happens if it does? They dig it up and fix it. After it runs past my house? Pardon? After it runs past my house? After it runs past my house. Are you going to have to check valve ring or something to stop the water? I don't know. That's something APC will have to talk to them and work out the details. But that's the reason that we have the technical review. That's the reason we hire a consultant that they pay for to come in and uh, well, you can say anything you want about that, but if the APC picks somebody, they have to pay for it. They don't pick the person to bring it in. The APC picks the person or the company to come in, just like these people here in the commissioners pick somebody to come in and do the evaluation. So if you want to talk about conflict of interest or anything like that, feel free to do so, but you don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to that. Because look, we're picking somebody, somebody else is paying for it because we require them to do that. So if you want to make it something else, feel free. Okay. What, what does this do for Franklin County? If the power is going to California and the tax abatement is going to G Gen X. Good question. What's Franklin County getting out of this? You'd be surprised where your power comes from. Uh, for instance, the electric grid. Everybody know what that is? You have lots of power companies putting power into the grid. It's taken out a variety of places across the country. You know about the, uh, the Honda plant in Brewster? They have a contract with Wind Farm in Texas. How did that electricity get from Texas to Greensboro? It certainly didn't, they didn't build a power line up here. So what happens is very much like what you folks do with farmers with your beans and your corn. It goes into a grid, if you want to look at that way. You harvest the product, maybe you take it to Aurora, maybe you take it to Lawrenceburg, move it to a grain elevator there, it gets put on a barge, gets moved someplace else. By the time somebody buys 2,000 bushels of your corn, 
is it your corn or is it somebody else's corn? You just went into the system. That's what happens with this electricity. The uh, plant up in Randolph County, that is about the size, it's a little bit larger than the one to build here. Hoosier Energy buys power from them. Hoosier Energy is the wholesale, if you want to look at it this way, that then distributes the power for the RMCs. So Hoosier Energy is buying power from solar farms in the state of Indiana and they're distributing it across the state. So the answer is, while it's generated here, it goes into that power line, it may, quote, go someplace else. Sooner or later, it all has to come out of the grid again and come back to flip that switch, that light comes on. You, nobody can tell me where the electrons came from that's causing that light to light. And so and that's the whole thing about this whole system is we talk about, oh, it's here, but it's gonna go to Detroit and we're never gonna get any of it. That's not true. What it comes down to is the grid system is set up to supply power to everybody. Unless, of course, you live in Texas. And Texas, if you remember a couple of winters ago, they had decided they could run their system better than anybody else in the world. And then suddenly they had a horrible winter. There were people with $10,000 electric bills because they were disconnected from the grid. Whereas the power that comes from whether it's something they built here or they built in Randolph County, they built it, God knows where. It goes into this grid. And there's more than one grid around us. In the Midwest, there's two big ones. And that power line they want to connect to goes to one of them. I can't remember which one it is right now. But there's two big ones. But all that power line gets redistributed. And electrons don't care where they go. You just have to. Does Franklin County get any money back from feeding that power system? No, but we get money back from the property tax and things like that. These people are going to pay. We get power, we get money back from what? All right, so let's go back to this slide. This is the money that we get back. They're making money, but they're paying us money for the privilege of being here. So for instance, the property taxes are gonna go up. Personal property as well as real estate taxes. So it will reduce the taxes in Franklin County. It could. It could. The council and the commissioners have to decide how to do this. Uh, council principally, uh, is that if you just collect these taxes and let them flow into the normal real estate or, or normal uh, uh, levy, that we get. It could reduce your taxes. But the council has to decide whether that's a good thing to do or whether they should do this, which is to designate these funds as a TIF fund. In other words, have this as a big war chest so that they can go and fix some of the problems that we have here that we just literally can't afford to do now. And we're, we're a poor county. I used to go on council 20 years ago, 24 years ago. And things haven't changed a whole lot. We're always hand in mouth. And it, the state limits how much we can raise. However, if something big happens and we don't do this, and the council and the commissioners have to decide to go out and float a bond to replace something big, say $5 million, then we're all going to pay for that. So without this, without taking advantage of the amount of money we can get, essentially in a lump sum from the whether it's GeneX or some other commercial company that comes in here, uh, there are things that will need to be fixed in this county. Eventually, we'll have to pay for it. Yes, sir? I have a question. Um, the property tax money that the county gets goes into the general fund, could be used anywhere in the county. And you were talking about uh, using the money in TIF. And TIF money has to be used in the economic development allocation area. So how are you going to, where is the economic development allocation area going to be? It's a very good question, and talking to Reedy, they said we could designate the entire county. Now the allocation area is where the money comes from, but the economic development area can be anything you want it to be. So we can designate the entire county. We do have to have a plan. Uh, you don't just say, I'm going to take this money and spend it somewhere in the county because it's easily wasted that way. So you have to have a plan that goes along with creating the TIF that says these are the categories, these are the kinds of things that uh, we want to spend it in. And then priorities have to be set with council and commissioners about the kind of things that we would like to accomplish. So but it's a good question. And it's a misunderstanding. A lot of people think it has to be spent where it's generated. It does not have to be. So. You had a question. Yeah. Could you hang out? 
when you buy a mower or something, you shop around. Yeah. Why are you stuck with green eggs? Well, they're the ones that are good, good question. Why are we stuck? We're not stuck with them. They're the ones that wanted to come here and do it. There's a lot of them that want to come here. Well, they're the ones that came in and secured leases with landlords. So they have leases out there. They have contracts with people, but you don't give us that information. I don't have that information. I don't know who they have contracts with and who they don't. But you knew there's 1,200 acres. Well, actually, I only learned that the day before uh, Reedy came to do the presentation because originally, if you remember, they talked about 1,800 to 2,000. And with our zoning and the setbacks and things like that, they reduced it down to 1250. That wasn't my, that wasn't me, that was them. And within that 1250, there's probably only about 1,000 acres of my panels on it. But again, that's not my call, that's their call. They're the ones trying to make money. This, this isn't 1,200 acres, this is gonna be all over the county. Well, it could be and it, and, and it may not be. That's one reason I said I think we need some kind of delay to work these kind of things out because there are certain places that they're just not going to do that. Uh, what they're going to look for is the same thing that any commercial venture would do. Do I have a site where I can do what I want to do at a profit? And so right now, the reason they picked where they picked would have nothing to do with the quality of the farmland or anything else. It had to do with that power line that's running across Bath Road as you're headed towards Oxford. That power line has excess capacity so they can put in the amount of power they want to put in. And just to let you know, this, the plant they want to put in is anywhere from 150 to 200 megawatts of power. To give you an idea how much power that is, the plant that's been shut down in Richmond for a number of years now, the two units there that would be running full time would only generate about 90 megawatts. So the amount of power they're putting out is almost double what we put out of that plant. And so you have to be careful where you put these things. You can't just plug it into it. If you try to plug that into the electric lines of REMC, you probably melt the wires because it would generate so much heat from, from the moving electricity. So the siding comes down to where can we hook up to a power line, put it into the grid, and then how can we get people to assign these for this? That's really what determines it. It all comes down to money. Unfortunately, we're, we're trying, money grabber. Hey, we're trying to hey, hey, I am so happy to be a money grabber for this county. I don't know what to do. Uh, for instance, I've got, I have tried my very best to make sure that anything we did in this county for the last few years has cost us not one dollar of our taxpayer money. Not one dollar. My money pays taxes. It does. Which pays federal taxes. It which does. supply ninety percent of all this. What happens when? the next president or whoever decides that they aren't going to fund this? That's a political question that I can't answer. All I can tell you is somebody comes here. You're just grabbing for money. Yeah, I am for the people in Franklin County. Go in front of your house then. I get, I get paid nothing to do this. Nothing. I wish you'd go away. You know what? <laughs> and a lot of people do. Guess what? I've got really thick skin. I've got narrows in my back my entire life. You have to contact to find out whether you're getting a good deal or not. But no, you're stuck on Green X. No, that's a Gene, other, other Gene X, by the way. give you twice as much, then why would you ever give a tax abatement to somebody that's coming in? Who cares? There is no tax abatement up there. You, you can get more taxes out of another company. Really? Have you done this? They're just trying to... Have you done this? Do what? Have you done this? We don't no, have you done it? No. What is it? So you're no better off than the rest of us. I didn't say I was. I'm asking you how to do it. If you've done it, tell me how to do it. It comes down to this. Hey, go hey, 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 and ask. We're, we're getting off into it. You're right. I, I apologize, Tom. Uh, so we need to be civil. I'm finished with my thing. Uh, somebody who has some questions later, they come down to my office. That question right now. It's okay. You talked about recycling. Yes. Do you know that when you recycle, it, you only get 10% of the cost it costs to recycle out of that material? They have not proven a good method to recycle it. I mean, you're throwing nice, let's feel good about this. We're going to recycle these materials. No, they're not. They're going to dump them in some landfill somewhere. Actually, they're not worth the money to recycle. That's, that's recycling process takes too much. Actually, I can't say that you're right or you're wrong, but I can tell you that I can tell you I can tell you twelve companies are doing it and they're making money at it. So
but then also they do not pay for themselves over the term. Apparently, there's 12 companies think of this. Because they're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's, I'm going to. Yeah, we'll get way off track here. Connie. Okay. Um, I just have a few comments. First of all, um, these folks are here to talk about the moratorium. We had no idea there was going to be a solar presentation because the agenda was not transparent, as said John Palmer, number one. Um, for the citizens of Franklin County, there are those of us that understand that John Palmer is the voice of GNX. But there are folks that don't know that connection and wouldn't have known that this solar presentation was going to be given today. My request is, in the future, if there's something this important, let's do it in the evening. So um, I had a number of young farmers come to me who really want to participate, but they have other jobs. And they can't be here. And they have things to say, and they have expertise. As far as the survey, um, the last survey was funded by Gen X. The information was given by Gen X. So uh, I don't have any faith in this either. So um, I just want to say with proper siting, um, solar industrial applications may be appropriate. In the opinion of many Franklin County residents, though, the proper siting should not be on prime bank ground. And I'm going to share a recent flyer I got in the mail, mail from Lindsay Patterson, state representative. You, you, she has ties here at Franklin County. Um, she has four pillars that she's working hard, and I'm quoting, working hard for Hoosiers on. And number two is protecting Hoosier farmland to help protect Indiana's farmland and food chain supply. Individuals or entities associated with foreign adversaries like Russia and China will be banned from purchasing or leasing ag land and mineral water or repairing rights. Um, that's House Bill 1183. Folks, GNX is a company that was founded in Germany, and this comes off their website, and is a foreign company. Just keep that in mind. Um, they're flashing big money around and asking for tax breaks and sheltering at the expense of our local schools. Salaries of our employees, public safety, roadways, and neighborhoods to fund pet projects, and that's not in the best interest of the county. The argument, and much of it is political in nature, about the benefits of renewable energy over coal is really not what we need to be focusing on. The heritage of American and Hoosier agricultural community is. One of you said at the last meeting that, that there's always a victim in every project. And that hit me really hard. Um, I believe that it doesn't have to be that way. There are good people asking for your help here. And they're wondering why you're not here anymore. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kay Palmer, and um, I come, I'm a third generation, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, third generation um, farm that I live on, and um, my family has farmed for years here in Franklin County, and I'd really like for you to um, honor the APC request for one year, because they have a lot of work to do. And it's obvious after this meeting today that they have a lot to do. There's a lot of questions I still have despite the presentation. And I really, really want you to honor the APC for a one year moratorium. Thank you. Okay. We're, going to, we're going to move on. The next thing on our agenda is the moratorium. Hey, Take a little time to get here. Where you? I'll speak out. Go ahead, Ed. Go up to the podium if you don't want. Good morning. 
name's Ed Derrickson. <coughs> and I fell and broke a femur a couple of years ago, so this this is a stable case I'm holding on to. Uh, I'm from a uh, system from Blooming Grove Township, <coughs> and I'm here to express my concerns regarding the request of the solar moratorium that has been submitted uh, to you by uh, concerned citizens uh, in Franklin County. <coughs> First, let me provide a few details about my background. In 1968 and 1969, I worked as a manufacturing process engineer for EPCO Ordnance in Richmond, Indiana. It was on the development for an army infusing device to atomic bomb. From 1969 to 2004, I worked for Sigmund's Distillers in Lawrenceburg, Indiana as a supervisor, facility process engineer, and a safety superintendent. I had served on two school boards and served area planning boards. I volunteered at several youth uh, baseball organizations uh, in Buffalo County and here in Franklin County. During the past 81 years, I have witnessed many changes in our environment in the greater Ohio Valley. Back in the 1950s and 60s, and uh, you never saw a blue sky with white fluffy clouds. It was a constant yellow haze, mostly sulfur dioxide and other pollutants uh, from due to the emissions from the coal fired electrical generation plants along the Ohio River. Prior to the 1950s, there were a lot of homes throughout Franklin County and throughout the entire United States that use coal and the environment has changed significantly in the last 20 years, since 1970 when the EPA was first regulated. I've, I've seen these changes personally. As the Environmental Protection Agency was created in uh, December 2nd, 1970, was when President Nixon was uh, under his, uh, under his uh, leadership, begins the development of the regulations and information to control our air quality. It has made a major contribution to improve the air we breathe today, all of us. Many of the older coal-fired electrical generation plants along the Ohio River and in our major cities have been closed down due to the age and the cost of upgrades needed to meet the new and current regulations. One of those facilities was a coal-fired plant located in our tourist stop in Dearborn County. It was a peaking generation plant. In other words, coal-fired plants need to generate Electric had to come on four hours before they anticipated the need for the, the peak power. And this generation grid was the one that comes through Franklin County over on our eastern border, eastern side of town. It's called the Indiana High Commission Power Grid. In, uh, I believe, in Springfield Township, there is a, 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 a generation. Uh, Plant there are the, uh, the, the along that grid. There's property owned by the Indiana Ocean Power Company. There's also a connecting uh, grid that goes over a buffer county called a buffer rural library. So it's served directly from Franklin County. It's <coughs> this grid serves Michigan. Uh, or Richmond, Muncie, Fort Wayne, Battle Creek, Michigan, and other entities. This is a portion of the power grid that passes through the eastern section of the county. My opinion, this electrical grid is a central component for the main, maintaining the reliability of the electrical power grid. <coughs> we developed here in our zoning code the alternative energy uh, 
provide sources for the wind, solar, and battery backup that can provide the needed component for reliability. The battery backup can be located at older power plants like Richmond Power and Rocket. Power and Rocket. Solar plants need to be located in multiple locations along the grid. As an example, if it requires for this peak capacity uh, during uh, the summer when they're running the air conditioning system and the winter, and they need additional heating, both the residential and, and our industrial power companies that can need 20,000 acres, you certainly don't want the solar supply uh, to be put all, you, don't, you would not want to put all your eggs in one basket. The solar supplies would be spread out due to the arrays in several fields over many miles of their distribution grid for the optimum efficiency. As a former member of the Franklin County Area Planning, we took several months to develop the alternative energy system in conjunction with the Franklin County Commissioners. It is my opinion that there is a great deal of due diligence and consideration taken by members to listen to our citizens during these hearings. I was not in favor of the 650 foot setback from the residential homes due to, to taking out smaller property owners out of the potential for, to participate in leasing out their property to a solar operator. I had looked at eight of the solar arrays in Wayne County, and there's I think about a dozen now. But I've looked at eight of them, and I've looked at four of them in Fayette County. <clears throat> there are noticeable differences in the screening of the soil fields. Some are very visible and others will not be even known to exist. I'm not in favor of the current level 3 screening. It is an overkill. The request for the moratorium is an attempt to do what? Rewrite the Franklin County area and the, the work that was done by the Franklin County Area Planning and the Franklin County Commissioners that spent months developing it. I'm not in favor of the moratorium. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we're going to move on here. Thanks, Ed. Uh, the moratorium uh, that the uh, area plan has sent to us, uh, there has been an ordinance repaired, prepared, I'm sorry. Uh, for that for one year if the Board of Commissioners so want to do that or we can reject it and ask for something else. So. I'd make a motion to accept this one year. Okay. Um, first I wanted to comment and apologize for my comments at the last at the last meeting where you know people um, felt like, and rightfully so, that I, I said that they needed to sacrifice or that there were victims involved in. It seems that oftentimes there are, and I meant no harm, but it seems that a lot of times when we do things like this, that there are good, uh, there's good that comes of it, but there are people that are adversely affected. Um, I apologize for the way that that sounded uh, I took it for the last time. Um, I also wanted, you know, I, took, I kind of sat on my hands at the last meeting. I reached out to the uh, concerning our liability. Um, I have not been a part of this since the beginning. Um, and I didn't know if the county had any liability. If we were to replace a moratorium, you know, the company's got money outstanding already. What have we signed? Um, that might obligate us to pay funds um, if they were to back out of the project. I'm told we've signed nothing and we have no liability at this point in time. Um, John Palmer kind of blindsided me with his comments and requests for a moratorium. Uh, today I came in um, prepared to move forward with one um, anyway. And, um, my request was going to be that we amend the ordinance to uh, to see the six-month moratorium that we had originally put in place. 
We've got a group that is actively working on our ADS, and we've done a lot of work on this in the past. There are things that they want to see changed, and that they uh, you know, that they want to uh, to see changed. I think we can work towards that. Um, in six months is a starting point that uh, can uh, allow us to move forward. Uh, let some people rest easy for a few months and then we can look at the project again and decide whether or not we uh, are going to move forward or kick the can down the road again. Um, so uh, that's Jerry made a motion I, prior. I'd like to see if you'd like to amend that motion or if we could. Look at a six month more program on this. Jerry's made a motion for a one year moratorium. Uh, I have a, like a question for the APC or maybe Gary. If we put a, a six month moratorium on, is it possible to extend that time if it's if the AES committee has not resolved all the issues from APC. Yeah, I think we could. We just have to go back through this process again. To extend it? Yes. And we still hold the cards. I mean, as far as the application goes, we have to have a signed road maintenance agreement with them before they can even apply. Uh, before they would have a completed application. So until we approve that road maintenance agreement, there's no, there's no application to be had. Uh, well, I think we need to do something right now. They can make application under the old ordinance, so. Are, are you still staying with your, your motion, Jerry? So. Uh, Stand with it. Yes. Okay. Jerry's made a motion to adopt Ordinance 2024-10 for a one-year moratorium. And then there is no second. So, John, do you make a motion then? I, I would make a motion that we amend Ordinance 2024-10 to six months on a moratorium. And if necessary to extend that time. Correct. I will second that. No. I'll prepare that I'm describing it now. Basically that it's a change as I see it would be to change the bottom of that ordinance to say until Noon, January 24, 2024, 2025. But it'll, it'll, the date will change based off. The date will change based off of when it gets set, accepted or set back by APC. But basically, the changes will be down the bottom for the effective date and how long it's going to end close to. I'll make those changes. Send them back. All right. To, to uh, the APC? Yes, to the right. All right. Can I ask a question? Yeah. As a, as a member of the APC board, uh, you said that this amendment has to come back to the APC for hearing again, correct? Yes, the ABC has the chance then to accept our recommendation, reject the recommendation, or send back uh, um, an amendment. So we have a hearing next Wednesday evening, so this could be heard as old business, and we can take a vote on it to send back to the commissioners again, or do we have to have another hearing? That's, that's my question, because there's advertising. Yeah, points to do that with, the, with the notice requirements, but you have a time frame of 45 days with which to, to review this. And so, uh, just shooting from the hip, I would say you'd be able to 
to do it at that here, but I'm just gonna have to put the card down. But. Okay. Just to try to be clear and uh, everybody in the audience and our board uh, makes the right decisions to kind of move this through the best we can and not get hung up because the procedure would be something done incorrectly. Yeah, I'm gonna look at that now. So that would be good for us to all know. So once that's done, we, if we would vote on it, send it back to the commissioners, then at that point, that's when that time would start, correct? If you vote to accept it, it will take effect on your task. Okay. If you vote to reject it, what happens? Does it go away? Come here. So once the procedure here is if they vote to uh, send it, reject it, or amend it, then the commissioners get one more chance to send it, and the commissioners get the final say. So if the commissioners come back after the ABC says either one year or reject it, the commissioners get the final say on what they determine. As long as it's followed that process. And that's the 45 or, or 90 days? It starts at 90, but once, these, okay. once this process comes back and forth, now it's 45. So okay. now we've sent it back to 45. Thanks for explaining that, Gary. Yeah. I have a technical question. If you would approve the one year today, in six months, can you look at that ordinance and do your six months review and rescind the ordinance, in effect making it a six month orient ordinance and get it approved today? Now, do they are either accepting the one year or their But what I'm saying is in six months, if they chose to look at that ordinance again, and say, oh, the committee's completed its work. We don't need this any longer. Can they rescind it? Yeah, just as they can do anything. Yeah, just as anything, they can. So to, and, to and complete some, the process today, they could approve the one year. They could have, yes. yes. Um, and I know that some, some ordinances are drafted. This was the ordinance that we received from APC was not drafted like this, but some ordinances from other counties are drafted such that you have the time frame, which is a maximum time, or once the analysis is completed, the moratorium is in. So that's not how this one was drafted as I read it. Okay. Missy, Missy Rats. Missy Rats. Uh, this is a public transportation's operating and administration figures from public transportation for the second quarter. I think you guys all have a copy. We just need a, a motion for me to sign it. I'll make a motion for Tom to sign the World Transit. Public Transport, I'm sorry, Public Transportation. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Center contract. Um, Garrett wants to make some changes to that contract, so he asked us to table it to our next meeting so he could add those additions into the contract. Uh, next thing on our agenda is uh, a settlement of the EEOC charge number 470-2024-02517. What we're doing is, uh, I think, agreeing to the terms of the EEOC. Is that correct? Yeah. I apologize, I was looking at the statute. We're agreeing to the terms of the EEOC yes. settlement. Yes. So I'll make a motion to agree to the terms of the EEOC settlement. I'll second it.
Councilor Carey's too. Uh, next, we have some invoices for uh, Jerry Whitney for the animal shelter, Earth Tech for the park sewer, and Graph Concrete Construction for concrete at the animal shelter. And Jerry Whitney, yeah, for the animal shelter. And we'll get those figures here in a second. Craft concrete is $91,874. Earth tech for the park is $86,008.35. And Terry Wiki is $2,805. $28,500. To be paid out of the ARCA money. So I'll make a motion if we uh, pay those invoices. I'll second the motion. All in favor. Uh, next we have claims and payroll. We have claims of $671,277.21. Payroll of $222,871.89. All attested by our auditor, Carl Bauman. Motion to please accept claims from payrolls today. Second. All in favor? Treasurer's monthly report for July. I make a motion that we accept the treasurer's report as submitted for July. Second. On favor. Uh, Justin. Papa Road looks really good. When, when will that pipe be in? The pipe is in. It's assembled. Tractors fall in. Later this week, unless the Jibber Fox is in. We get the Jibber Fox all in. It's going to be a couple weeks. Yeah, you got the parts right. They're working around. Oh, get a one is done. Pardon? Old State Road 1 is done. Okay. All the books have been built. We're going to pay you it Friday. That'll be done. And we'll be waiting on the upgrade. Somewhere around the second week of August, maybe? Hopefully. We got an electrician up there last week, so hopefully they're playing something a little here soon. We was asked to make a turnaround on Buena Vista Road where the bridge is going in. Is that going to happen or? I'm going out there when we get in there. So we can make some work. Okay. Pete, do you have anything? No, sir. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, Carl and I had asked prior to meeting about the ordinance number. That we approved at the last meeting regarding the handbook. Mm -hmm. 10. Okay, we just approved well, ordinance number 10 today, so. Well, we'll have to change that to 11 then. Okay, so ordinance number 10 is approved at the last meeting, and um, I've had a couple of people, a different people come to me following. I approved or agreed to approve that based on uh, information that I thought that all the departments were represented. My fault for not digging into the handbook further to see who was a part of the handbook committee, the changes, but um, I've had different departments come to me saying that they want to be represented in the hours change or at least be heard. I've had others that have come with concerns about us taking away um, comp hours. Uh, and you know, I think we need to look at that. We've talked about the pay of the county and the benefits that we have, um, and to take those away uh, is is an error that we need to to look at. I think different members, the people that were a part of the handbook committee, didn't know that that change was going to be made, uh, or expressed that they were unaware that that change was going to be made. So I'm going to make a motion that we rescind uh, ordinance number ten. We do, for compliance purposes, need to rework that and get it taken care of as quick as possible. Um, and 
Carl's got some additional information on that. I'll make a motion to rescind ordinance number 10 um, on the handbook uh, to correct these issues. I don't think comp buyers are being taken away comp at all. They uh, got to use all but 40 within that year is the way I understand. That, is that correct? Yeah. They were just restricted because they didn't want to have 120 hours at the end of the year that would need paid out. That's why the reduced amount at 80 was given. It gets to 80 and then they can be paid out back down or how many ever they want to keep. They can only go forward 40. Um, people who do our handbooks only suggested we only roll forward 20. It's that delicate on how many comp buyers you actually have, and you have to pay that within one year or use it at the time that it's actually earned, and we have no way of tracking that. If they earned an hour today, I have no way in my system to know that that's used exactly from a year from today. I have no way. Um, in regards to the hours, um, the State Board of Accounts has updated their manuals for um, the auditor, treasurer, assessor, um, and the recorder and clerk. Um, and there's actually a section now that refers to office hours. Where it designates that the Board of Commissioners do have the authority to designate the hours for county offices subject to the approval by the elected official. It is the elected official who is charged with the administration of certain laws and the performance of statutory duties. The office hours, the working days of elected officials and their staff should be at the discretion of the official upon whom the responsibility rests for performing the functions of his office. The elected official not only has a right but a duty to keep his office open at such times and for such duration as necessary for carrying on duties imposed upon him by law. I've been fighting this for six years and I've had nothing but resistance on it. So I just want to know that I have been trying to do um, setting those hours so that I can get the the duties performed in a timely manner and I've had nothing but resistance and it appears like it is the Board of Commissioners that have that authority. I thought we already fixed that. I know, but I'm just saying. I just um, wanted to make a statement. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> uh, but back to the comp hours. You're, you're going by federal labor laws, right? You're, you're... Yeah, that's the uh, federal so, labor law. Employees read that I did myself to, to read that it was the hours were being cut from 120 hours to 80 hours the way that it was understood. That's so, just what can be carried over. 120 can be carried over today. Um, they were reducing it to 80, so it got paid out more often, so that at the end of the year there wasn't such a large sum that might need to be paid out to get it done for you. Can still we, carry we're not taking anything away from anybody on that. You either get paid or you got comp, but at the end of the year, you got to take it except for 40 hours. You can carry that to the next year. There were a couple of office holders that approached me regarding the fact that their offices were or appeared to be limited to 32 and a half hours by the ordinance. Um, and you know, they wanted to be heard uh, on the matter themselves. So that's if, and they can, they, can, they can file with you guys and make that if they want that, mm -hmm. if that's what they want. If, if they want for me. I think uh, what Carla's saying, she's got to do what's necessary to make her office run according to the rules and regulations of the State Board of Accounts and Federal Laws. Mm -hmm. And every one of the office holders has to do that. The, every one of them has exactly to do what she's saying, but our handbook, the way it's written, that almost seems to restrict restrict that. Yes, and it probably should be the minimum of 32 and a half up to a maximum of what is probably how it should be, and then yes. report it to the Board of Commissioners what they actually want. Yeah. Or need it. We rescind it to get that language correct, and then uh, we vote on that. Can you take a look at it, Garrett, and see if it needs amended? I don't want to rescind it. And one of the things you're looking at is just like making a variable depending on the request of the office to up to 30, minimum of 32.5 to up to 40 to make your income request more. Is that what I understood? Mm -hmm. so. And all is approved by council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
say to King Council what? No, I didn't hear you. No, it didn't say anything about that. No. Attorney General. I mean, you can't, you you can't, can't stop you can't stop the elected official from doing their job. Right. If the elected official does not perform their duties, they can be removed from office. I get that, but they they do have to have a, you do have to have a salary ordinance for your office that um, restricts the budget of the office, doesn't it? And that's all I'm looking at there. No, I, you know, I just want to get the language correct. If, it, if there's nothing that needs to be looked at by council, uh, then I stand corrected on that. But if there, um, if there's anything that does need to be approved financially, then council would have to look at that at that piece. But my thing right now is just getting the language correct so that every office knows that they are not restricted. Um, and that what their duty is as far as uh, taking care of the duties of their office. And we can look at that, but uh, the council's only role in this is funding. They, they have no say so in the hours. It's funding, that's what they do. But we can look at that, and if it needs amended at our next meeting, Gary will have it to make sure that all office holders are following the law. Offices that have only part time employees, if you're looking at adjusting full time hours, does, does that have any impact on part time hours? No. I would think no. It doesn't, but I think. What constitutes that adjustment? I think you're, well, that's got to do with the ADA or the. The health insurance, it has, that's what that's, that's why that's limited, because if you work more than the 30 hours a week, then you have to do an average of hours over the month, and you've got to do all these calculations to see whether or not they're actually a full-time equivalent. And once you determine that, then you do have to offer them insurance. Um, so part-time is a federal thing, not locally state? It's, it has to do with the calculations that's used. The 28 that's local is so that they stay underneath that 30, so they're trying to make sure that they don't, or under the other 30, so they don't get to that threshold of having to do those calculations of being a full-time equivalent. If they work, they, they can only work so much even in a month. I don't even remember what the amount is. It's like 124 hours or something like that a month is all somebody's allowed to work, or you have to start looking at them to make sure they're not a full-time equivalent. Where they'd be eligible for health insurance. That's in Obamacare. Just, just curious, since I have part-time employees only, I don't know if it would impact their. Well, there's something that you have a statute that has something to do with appointing a first deputy, so that's probably something we should talk to council about. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Can you clarify the comp time, Tom? Can you clarify the comp time? Are they allowed? I think after 80 hours, they've got to be paid. Right. Is that immediate starting with effective now? I, I just honestly want them down to the point by the beginning of the year, is what my concern is, is that this was in place and they couldn't get the handbook done, they couldn't guarantee us that they could get the changes to the handbook done through the company that does it. And I just wanted these, that in place by the start of the year so we didn't have to make all the changes in our system next year. That's, that's, I'm, I'm not going to enforce it, but I just want by the end of the year that it has to be down to 40. Down to 40. Mm -hmm. I know some, some people have over 80 now, you know. So next year or whatever, they're only allowed to do 80, they're not allowed to do 120. So we're taking that 40 from them? Yeah. You're not taking anything from them. They have to be paid. They was allowed to accumulate 120 hours. Yes. Now they're only allowed to accumulate 80. Yes. So we took 40 friends. You took 40 that they can accumulate, but right. instead of accumulating it, they'll have to be paid. But currently, too, they could actually roll forward 120 hours. Great. Right. So we have to. 40 hours, I mean, they can only get it down to 40 hours at a time. The problem the guys had is you took 40 hours of comp time from them that they could save to use for a vacation or to use for a sick day. Or whatever. You're only allowing them to make sure 80 hours instead of 120. I, I'm going to tell you, I don't even know if I was asking when the 80 hours was discussed. Um, 
that's not really my concern. My concern is that it gets just that it gets down to the forty. I mean, I can make sure it's down to the forty before the end of the year. That's that's my that's my concern. I think that's her goal. No, it's not how much I got. Just real quick, uh, this ordinance that you guys passed, the council had, from my understanding, nobody on council knew anything about this ordinance coming through. I'm okay with people going to 40 hours and you running your office and everybody running their office correctly, but there's ways to get there that needs to involve council. This ordinance just added probably $100,000 worth of money to our budget without us approving. And I know you can probably move money around and do whatever you need to do, but if, you, if you're doing that, I think council needs to be involved when we're talking about that much money. If we're talking the whole county going to 40 hours, I'm fine with that. But we have to work together and get to that number. If we just, these three offices probably added over $100,000. If we add the entire county, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to 40 hours. We need to work together to get there. I was had no clue this ordinance was coming through, and it, it just and we and we've got budget hearings starting next week, and that just throws a wrench in our entire budget. I don't know how we keep all our employees in that hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to the salary ordinance without. I'll be honest with you, I don't know how we add all these hours and then we don't lose. How people have to lose their jobs. I, I don't know how that works. I don't know how the numbers work. We can't just pull hundreds of thousands of dollars out of the year. I'm already down at part time. A part time person would be working 28 hours in my office. With them working the additional seven and a half, that's 30 hours. So that's all it's the same 28 and 30. It's not much difference. I get that, but you've been going for a few years with no part with that person not being. And they've been working the overtime those two years. Okay. Well, so then we need to leave. Then we need to figure out a way. We need to have these conversations and and deal with this not in a public meeting, but in how we need to handle things. You know, if we have a handbook committee, council needs to be involved in that. Just my thoughts. This is not our money. At the end of the day, it's taxpayers' money, and we got to do with it what's best. And, and, and just adding five hundred thousand dollars or whatever the number is is not doing our track. I'm, I'm telling you that we want to work with you together to make this happen. I, I want to see your figures when you're coming up with hundreds of thousands of dollars. You got those figures? You come up with that amount of money? Well, when you're adding, if you take one, I mean, just let's do some rough math. I mean, I can get you a spreadsheet on what it's going to cost if you go to 40 hours a week. Just how many hours did you add? 30. In your one office. Okay, so that's basically a full-time person that you've added. Each and we have thirty thousand dollars, thirty-two thousand dollars a year. That's basically sixty thousand dollars that we've added to the county budget. That's one office. Take that times three. You're one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Each person, first deputies, make thirty-two thousand dollars. By the time we get a FICA, a perk, a PEC, all this extra stuff, and this is not including health insurance not including health insurance, you're basically adding another $10,000 on top of that. I actually had a point of including the PERF and the FICA and all of it, and it's $28,000. And nobody's adding health insurance because we're not adding another person. You're, yeah, you're, that figure's already there. Okay. I agree Sorry. we need to talk because I've been talking about it for six years. Well, I'm, okay. Thanks I'm, for I'm agreeing frustrated. Right. I'm frustrated with the whole thing. <laughs> Okay. Anything else? Sarah, I wanted to say something. Uh, Commissioners, what was the dollar amount of your EEO settlement? That's confidential. I don't think that can be disclosed. If you put in a public records request, we'll provide all the documentation where you will provide the okay. Who made a motion? John made a motion to adjourn. No, we made no. a motion to resend that. To so oh. Okay. I just want to make sure there was not a second. No, we haven't got no second on it, so we'll try to amend it. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second the motion.